just wanted to let you know, Canada's History, um, we're a charity, um, a not-for-profit organization, um, mission-driven as uh, charities are. And, um, you know, we have publishing as part of what we do. We publish Canada's History Magazine and Kayak, Canada's History Magazine for Kids, and a French edition, Navigue dans l'Histoire de Canada. Um, we also um, have educational programs, and we are the producers of the Governor General's History Awards. So in terms of sort of a multi-touch uh, 360 um, relationship with our audiences, it's done through our media, it's also done through our awards programs, and it's done through uh, partnerships, uh, similar to the content partnership that uh, Caitlin was talking about, um, and also some custom publishing for third parties, um, where it makes sense and is aligned with our vision. So um, what I wanted to just start off with was the idea that, you know, you can, it's a dangerous thing to make assumptions about your audience because not all your audience is, is you. Um, I'm not representative of the Canada's history audience. Um, I mean, a lot of consumer magazines will have very tight demographics. And so it could be that in some cases, um, the media company leadership is similar to the demographic of the publication. But in our case, it's not. Um, when I joined Canada's History, I asked the CEO at that time, um, you know, who are our readers? I want to go meet some of our readers. And uh, this person said, well, they're older, they're mostly men, and uh, they stay home and they read books. And so I thought, okay, this is not an easy audience to connect with. But, you know, when I started looking at oops, the data of Canada's history, I realized that was actually incorrect. Um, it was based on a survey that had, um, some problems in the methodology. And in fact, the audience at Canada's History Society was very diverse in many, many ways, which I, I'll get into. Um, and knowing about our audience in a deeper way has made um, us change what we do and change how we work. So um, yeah, so why do we need audience data? So for me, I have this mantra, mission, audience, revenue. And if there's something uh, that I'm working on that doesn't address one of those things, then I think to myself, I probably should not be doing this. Um, it's best when I'm doing something that hits all three of those things, um, delivers on the mission, um, expands our audience and, in, and diversifies and increases revenue. If I'm working on something that does all those three, then it's great. Um, so you need to know your audience so that you're creating relevant editorial. Um, for example, at Canada's History, our two largest audience, audience segments are millennials and Gen Z. So um, that's over 50% of our audience. And those generations are incredibly ethnically diverse. And so once we know something about that, um, we have to adjust preconceptions about the stories that uh, people want to read. Um, we also need to know audience data to create um, appropriate paid readership campaigns for print or digital. So, you know, you've got to know uh, where your audience's habits and what they, their purchasing habits are so that you can tap into the marketing that's going to find the, that potential audience. Same with digital platforms. Some platforms are great for really young people. Some are great for older people. So you have to make sure that you're using the right platform for the right audience. And then of course, you need your audience data for revenue, whether it's advertising you're selling or sponsorship to an event or a content partnership. It's obvious you need to tell the outside partner who they're gonna be talking to. It's also really important for philanthropy. I know we have um, a couple of uh, not-for-profits on the call today. Um, um, foundations have charitable objectives and um, they want to know uh, how 
uh, organization, a not-for-profit charitable organization, is going to help them meet their charitable objectives. In the same way, you know, if you're doing a project for a brand, you need to bring the case that you're going to be delivering to them on their marketing objectives. So it's, it's, it's very similar. And the same with government investment, frankly. There are government departments that have specific objectives and you know you have to know whether your uh, audience fits. So sources for audience info. Um, we've got our circulation audits and reports, we've got digital analytics and we have surveys. So two of these sources for audience information, CERC, inf uh, CERC and analytics, they describe what people do, um, their actions that they take. So whether it's how often they renew or their price history or you know, where they're coming to your website from, whether they, um, you know, the kind of content that they interact with on social media, you have an idea of what they're actually doing. Whereas surveys, it's uh, what people say. And so um, I always uh, just um, mention to people to be mindful about a survey and its uh, methodology because um, methodology can skew your results like the example I told you about of uh, an old survey that was paper and, and pen. So of course the results were skewed because in uh, 2015, how many people uh, filled out paper and pen surveys, not very many. And, um, and also there's a difference between what people do and what they say. So for example, when I was the publisher at Canadian Art Magazine, people used to say to me, um, oh, you know, I hate top 10 lists. They're so reductive. Um, so when, you know, when we sent out our e-newsletter, but in, you know, and maybe it's true for those people, but those top 10 lists of, you know, the fall, art gallery season are what were always the most popular posts that we ever did. So there is a schism between what people say and what they do. So you just have to be mindful of that. Um, okay, let's look at, I'm gonna look at some of the sources. Um, so first circulation audits and reports. I don't know how many of the magazines on, on the call today are actually audited, but regardless of whether you're audited, you can always pull a report. And um, so what I, I'm, I'm trying to do now is talk about, you know, the, the mission, audience, and revenue implications of our business, but how it relates to audience data. So normally I would talk about brand extensions and, you know, programs and partnerships, but this, this session, I thought I'm going to try to hang all of that on the idea of knowing your audience and the audience data. So, I mean, the first thing that we all have is information on our subscriber pool. So, and this bears repeating. Um, I, when I do traveling consultant sessions, I always say, you know, if you're, if you've got 4% on your final uh, renewal campaign, it means you need to add another renewal campaign. It means, you know, your, your audience wants to read your, your magazine. They're just not being they're just not taking up the first, second, or third efforts. Um, so you have to keep keep trying. Um, you know, if you were doing a campaign like, I don't know if you can see this. I don't, can you see this? We can see it, yes. Okay. So this is a fold out that we did in, in newspapers across the country for our 100th anniversary. Um, it was a subscription promotion for our, our centenary. And, um, you know, if you get a 3% response rate, you're over the moon, like, and it's, it's very expensive to do a promo like that, you know, like 300,000 brochures going out. Um, whereas if you just add a, if you just make more of an effort on your renewals, it's a lot cheaper way to go. So I, every presentation, I always <laughs> mention that don't forget renewals. Um, the other way to understand your audience too is um, by taking a close look at your renewals by source. So for example, um, direct mail, um, one of our major sources at Canadian Art was uh, Style at Home. So, you know, visual art, um, there weren't very many large visual arts magazines in Canada. Um, 
there were some that maybe had a thousand subscribers um, and we were at the time around 20,000, I think. Um, but Style at Home, their circulation was much, much higher. So even with a small, like one and a half percent response rate, the overall number of subscriptions we get from direct mail um, was a good number. And then, you know, and you, and if you follow, like were those Style at Home people did they renew? Did they convert? You know, so taking a, a close look at um, how people convert over time and the sources, it does tell you something about your audience too. So, you know, if they're from Canadian Geographic or Style at Home, you can look at their media kits and if they're paying to have um, demographic data done, it can tell you a little bit about your reader too. Um, okay. The next source that we have for understanding our audience is uh, digital analytics. And um, whether that's Google Analytics or social analytics, um, it doesn't matter. Um, when we redid our website in, I think it was 2016, we were late to going to mobile responsive. It was, it was very costly, um, but we decided um, we were going to define what the top two audiences um, for the site would be. And I know a lot of times when I'm consulting, you know, people will say, well, we want it for everyone. But if it is for everyone, it makes it really hard to make business decisions about what goes where and what you're doing and what your calls to action are gonna be. Um, so we decided out of the whole list that what we call the intrigued clicker and the teacher, we're gonna be the two main audience segments that would transform our readership and audience and the way we did our work. The other one, the other audience, the learners, the enthusiasts, even you know people deep into the history sector, we figure history sector people are going to follow us no matter what. So the intrigued, um, you know, non-history person and teacher were our primary audience personas. So that first persona was, um, you know, someone who say, I'm not a history nut, but this story is really interesting. So, you know, there's someone who might enjoy cultural travel. Um, they're big social media consumers, lots of mobile device use. Um, they're curiously minded. So, um, you know, the story, when we did a story about the Spanish flu, this was a couple of years before COVID, you know, if that came up in your feed and it was right at the beginning of a global pandemic, you're going to read it. Or, you know, there was a story that we did about an aircraft carrier that was made out of ice in Jasper National Park during World War II because ice couldn't be um, seen by radar. And it's just, you know, a very unusual story or the first Canadian woman publisher was a, a black woman named Marianne Shad, and she was an abolitionist. And, um, you know, they're just, they're human stories that people are, are really interested in. And they're mostly driven online by social media. So at the time, Facebook was the main channel for this, as well as e-newsletter e marketing. Um, so you can see at the bottom, um, this 100,000 number of Facebook followers. That's um, something we were really working on enlarging since the website launched. So, um, you know, if things come up like it's International Women's Day, we'll repackage our women's history content, um, cultural travel lands in the summer or the spring. Um, during elections, we can repackage stories about the history of elections or US-Canada relations. So that was the channel for that. Facebook has changed, as we all know. Um, so um, we're actually rethinking that right now. The second persona was the history teacher. And what we were really trying to do was, um, we were doing some of this work already, creating lesson plans and resources, but we decided that we were going to um, go deeper into that. And uh, we have a children's magazine, as I mentioned. And we thought that the history teacher audience would be mostly high school, but in fact, it turned out to be kids and um, elementary school teachers. And uh, the 
it changed the way we were working because the children's publishing and the educational programs were really doing their own thing. And now we work much close, more closely together. And it's to the point where, you know, the education team is working with us to create a custom pub for an education program. So it's even like, you know, internal custom content. Um, so that's the history audience. And what we did there was we really focused on e-newsletters as well as Twitter, which is, is really good for um, teachers. So um, either driving them to online stories or, um, you know, we actually shifted the model of our children's magazine from a subscriber only publication to now we're doing free classroom issues. So print in this case, um, this is an issue about commemoration. We printed 100,000 copies of those. Um, we did 60,000 copies of an expanded Black history issue. And um, really, for me, I think the print is really important because StatsCan says that the lowest uh, income quartile of Canadians have 20% of them have no internet at home. That's like no internet, not crappy internet, no internet. So, you know, when everything shut down in March and schools were online and here in Ontario, we had the, um, the greatest number of closed, greatest number of uh, days closed. What were those kids without internet doing? They basically lost access to their education. And there's a higher proportion of people in rural areas, uh, you know, multi-generational families, racialized people, and people who live on reserves who do not have um, that access. So for me, the print is, it's partly about addressing an equity issue. And so that teachers would have a high quality uh, piece that's Canadian content um, and for free. And uh, it's every kid can have it regardless of their income. So yeah, we, you can see here our um, teacher newsletters, we've increased the number of recipients over the last three years. So, I mean, right now we have um, 30,000 recipients of our e-newsletters. E um, teachers are probably, um, well, there's some repeats um, among those lists, but the teacher newsletters are, are great, not only for building our audience, but there's also a revenue side. So in the case of a special partner, so for Racket, it was Fila. For us, it would be um, the Vimy Foundation or the uh, Ontario Heritage Trust. So an organization that has a similar enough mission that we allow them to do sponsored newsletter to teachers. We don't do it for everyone because teachers wouldn't stand for it and they'd unsubscribe. So, I mean, there's a revenue piece to that as well, which is, which is great. So I'm pulling this um, more digital analytics and um, there still are some uh, titles who don't have that or not looking at that on their site. Um, I really, it's, it's, it's indispensable. So I'm just showing you this to say, um, you know, when we, and again, when I first started at Canada's History, I was told that the readership was uh, primarily male, but it became really apparent looking at the analytics that any content that we had on women's history was very popular. So for the anniversary of the first Canadian women getting the vote, the 100th anniversary, we created a, a special editorial package in print. And then every year after that, for International Women's Day, we've created new content to repackage in advance of International Women's Day. And, and that day is one of our top performing days of the year. It's, um, you know, that spike in readership is on that day, but it can be any day of the year. If I pull information about what the top 20 articles are, 10 of them are gonna be about women's history. And I pulled this one, you can see the orange, um, that's 2020. 
So March 2020 was International Women's Day, but it was also the beginning of the COVID closures. And that's when um, this article that um, we had published a couple years earlier, actually it was published on the 100th anniversary of the 1918 pandemic, the so-called Spanish flu, which wasn't Spanish. Um, and uh, that article had uh, some quotes from Dr. Anthony Fauci in it. And that article just was read so much um, over the, the next year. Um, so that was responsible for a lot of that spike. And also online learning um, with everyone turning to find, you know, how, how to help their kids uh, get through school. People were looking online for resources. So our audience really shifted and it was, you know, even though we made the decision back in 2016 to really focus on, on teachers, you know, in 2020, it really, it was great to have all those resources there. And it's, as I said, it's really shifted how we work. Um, when that happened in the analytics, we, we saw right away what was going on. So, you know, we, created a couple special newsletters about, um, so, you know, with the subject line, so you're a homeschooler now, which was, you know, had an enormous open rate and share, share rate. Um, and the same with the pandemic article too. Um, so for the, um, we actually commissioned a new piece by John Lawrence, um, putting COVID-19 into historical context. So, um, because we knew people wanted to understand um, what was going on. And some things are, are the same, like arguments over masks. And that happened in 1918 too. Um, this is just showing, you know, another spike in our, in our online readership, which makes total sense. It's Remembrance Day, right? And it's the same month that we have, uh, um, there's Thanksgiving, there's one particular article that is delivers year over year um, about the difference between Canadian and U.S. Thanksgiving. But, um, I guess people don't don't remember what the difference is, um, but that is a big one. So to understand our audiences, um, I I look in and see. So what are they googling? Um, how are they finding us? Because most of our traffic is um, is organic search driven from organic search. So these are the the um, words that they're using um, in search engine to discover us. And we have a French site as well. So the, the terms are, are sometimes uh, the same. Um, you know, New France isn't in the English list, but indigenous history is in both lists, black history is in both lists. And then I also look closely at what they're reading because compared to Googling, I mean, it's one thing if people Google it, but what are they actually reading? So, um, as I said um, before, like women's history is top of the list. Um, fur trade, because it's so tied to the beginning um, of Canada as a, a nation state from confederated state um, is important and it's taught in the schools. And classroom resources, as I said, are just growing and growing. Okay. Um, so I just want to say, so out of the topics listed here, um, you know, because we were so aware of what people were reading and what they were Googling, we had an opportunity with a corporate sponsor to make a proposal for a project. And um, I was asked, you know, which, which, which project can we scale up on to propose to this sponsor? And uh, we had done a black history issue. It was digital only um, because we used to do digital classroom issues. And I thought, you know, it would be great if we could expand it, commission new content and then uh, and, and print it in a fairly large quantity to distribute as classroom sets across the country. So um, I knew um, because of the what people are reading that black history would be a really good topic. So um, when we launched um, through our teacher's e-newsletter, a registration page for that issue, 
all 60,000 copies were reserved in three hours, which um, is pretty incredible that um, there's like a huge thirst and desire for information. And then it becomes being about how do you manage this appointment, right? <laughs> um, we also partner with the National Center for Truth and Reconciliation. We've done a few publications with them. Um, here's a couple. And it's kind of like, um, you know, custom content um, partnership. Um, they're the knowledge experts and the knowledge keepers. And we have the expertise in creating a publication and getting it to the readers. So in that case, for the new one we have coming out, for the National Day of Truth and Reconciliation in September, we're doing 200,000 copies. And those were fully reserved in two days. And again, commemoration. So commemoration of um, like military uh, events and um, that's a, a topic that people Google as well. So we did a commemoration issue for classrooms and again, 100,000 copies and they, they were reserved instantly. So it really helps, you know, the analytics really help me make a decision about, okay, what project do, what, what content of ours are people really, you know, aching to have? What, what do they need in their hands to make uh, their teaching jobs easier? What's gonna help them in the classroom? What's gonna broaden the discussion of what, counts as Canadian history for uh, a younger generation, those, those Gen Z kids who are a very diverse uh, generation. Okay, so surveys. Um, I saw this, I can't remember where I saw it. So um, yeah, there's survey bias, right? Um, as I mentioned before, the sample of um, people who took part in a, in a survey that we did that was paper and pen in 2015, or I guess it was earlier, 2013, before my time at Canada's History, it's going to be biased because um, who's going to fill that out? Um, you know, pollsters, political pollsters uh, for a number of years did not uh, poll um, cell phone users. So um, in the first uh, uh, Barack Obama's first term, um, the election, they pollsters um, were um, predicting results, but they weren't based on those cell phone users. And the Obama campaign was very digitally oriented. So, really have to make sure you get your sample right in order to um, make information reliable. So I just pulled this. Um, this is our Canada's history. Um, can, sorry, I just wanted to thought there was a chat to me. This is our Canada's history of vivid data research. So vivid data is a company that surveys thousands of people um, for many magazines and newspapers. And um, there's so many questions, like it's just unbelievable. Um, they oversample in areas to make an accurate reflection of the Canadian population. So if the average age of, you can see in my last column here is the Canadian population as a whole. Um, if the average age is 46.79, then their sample, they're going to go try to get that um, average age as well. Um, if generation Z is, 15% of the population, they will try to do that in their sample. So it's a more accurate reflection of people in Canada. So three columns here. So this one, this second last one is all of our readers, print, the people who purchase the print, the household members who read the print, even though they didn't buy it, and the digital. So one thing we know from Vivid Data is that more than 50% of our reader households have children aged 18 and under in them. So I describe our readership as a family readership, which, you know, if you're um, like a men's fashion magazine, having, you know, this kind of uh, very um, diverse age groups in your readership is a real problem because usually uh, a magazine will want to have a very precise 
um, demographic so they they can sell ads against it. We're not, we're, we're very diverse in our readership. And that really works well for some other organizations like cultural organizations who are trying to diversify their audiences and um, for sponsorships as well, you know, where they're trying to reach a diverse audience as well. So you can see here, like all of our readers, I don't, I'm trying to put my uh, cursor around the average age for all of our readers. I don't know if you can see that on your side, but the average age of all of our readers is 37.9. So this is not the readership that I was told um, was uh, our reader when I first started. Yes, the people who buy it, as, either as a paid subscription or a newsstand, are in their early 50s, but there are other people in the household that are reading it. Um, one thing that is uh, really interesting to me is that um, the Born in Canada stat, if I look at all of our readers, we have a greater diversity of people from um, other who were born in other countries who read Canada's history. And that's, you know, that's really a good piece of information to know. I think it's more than 20% of our readers are of South Asian descent, for example. So, you know, if I'm talking to a potential partner like Parks Canada, um, they are really trying to reach younger people and a more diverse and, and new Canadians. So, um, you know, our title is a really good fit for them. Um, you can see here at the bottom two rows, millennials and Gen Z are make up more than, um, well, they make up 65% of our readership. That's, that's a lot. Um, so Gen Z is, um, they only measure from 14 years and up, but uh, the oldest Gen Z people are 26 now. So they go from 14 years old to 26. The oldest uh, millennials are now in the early 40s. So, you know, 15 years ago, we were really worried, like, oh my gosh, are millennials gonna actually subscribe to a print magazine? Well, yeah, they are. So I'm gonna wrap up very closely because I think we only have 10 minutes left. Um, this is a vivid data chart of all the magazines they measure. Here's Canada's history here. Um, you can see we got a bump in print readership on our 100th anniversary year. But then if you go to the digital, you can see everyone's going up on digital, right? The blue bar, everyone's going up on the digital, except this magazine called Urbania. I don't know why. So the question really is, you know, and it's for us too, how do we monetize those digital readers? And for us, especially the younger ones, um, you know, our revenue streams for Canada's history is primarily subscriptions, some advertising, but not too much, some digital advertising, um, mostly around education, but partnership revenue. So content partnerships, like another example would be when the Hudson's Bay company wanted to do a book for their, on their history for the 350th anniversary um, they had us do that for them. And that was uh, certainly a revenue stream for us. Um, government investment, because we're a charity, we have an annual donation campaign to our subscribers. For our 100th anniversary, we started a mid-level giving program called Editor's Circle, kind of modeled on a museum curator circle type of program, and then major gifts and sponsorships um, so when I was talking about, you know, that free content that um, is for kids, um, the revenue there has been primarily major gifts, um, some government, um, but, um, but also corporate sponsorships. Um, here's another example of a publication that we did in in French, it's uh, for the French Quebec newsstand. And uh, it's uh, Saint-Commerbe de nos Musée. So it's 50 um, objects from our museums. And um, it's on, it'll be on Quebec newsstands next month. 
no, it's on Quebec New Sense now, and then it'll be free in the museums. But for that project, we had um, a foundation um, support for that. So there are many, I think, sources of income for, for these projects. And um, it's about knowing who that audience is so that you can meet the objectives of whoever is paying the, the bill on it. And that's, that's it. Yeah, I, I, I'll jump in here with a question, which was, um, I, I love that that was um, sort of the book ending of the presentation, which is just this like sort of inherited narrative we have a lot of the time in media, which is like, well, our audience has always been this, and we yeah. know this because of why. And the truth <laughs> is, you know, until you meet them in events and then do research, you know, so I was really happy. I gasped when you circled 37.8. Um, and my question is, you know, how do you, how do you go back and turn that into more plans, right? Now that you know, now that you have this, what's your sort of protocol or what do you think are best practices for turning that into like sort of actionable onboarding for the next couple of generations of readership? So yeah, everyone gasps when I tell them the average age because it's definitely not what they expect. And um, some of our older donors are so happy because they think, oh my gosh, people still love history. History's not dying. <laughs> yeah, they're really happy. Um, the next, I mean, the next thing we're, big thing that we're doing right now is um, recoding our website for um, like security and safety, um, especially with a lot of young people using it. So that's an expensive endeavor. Mm -hmm. um, when, we when we did this site in 2016, we thought kids were gonna use it more. It's like, no, no, kids actually aren't using it. It's the teachers that are using it. Like they're the information channel. So we don't, you know, we don't have to do sort of little game gimmicks uh, for kids. Cause honestly, they're gonna play Minecraft and you know, whatever else they wanna play. They're not coming to us to play games. And it would cost a fortune to um, do something to compete with, with Microsoft. Yeah. Who are we kidding? Um, so I think, you know, we're in the next three years, we just shifted um, like this month to the new model of the classroom sets for our children's publishing. So that's brand new. And it's like kind of in the books for the next three years. Um, for digital, it's recoding for security and safety. Um, for magazine circulation and audience development, um, we just launched a um, video series based on the comics that are in our kids' issues. Mm -hmm. So we've got animated shorts. And we were fortunate, like we got selected as part of the CBC um, development program. And so we, you know, did the show Bible and, you know, we made it through the first development phase, but we weren't picked for production. So only one kid's thing was picked for production out of whatever, 10 or 20, whatever there was. But um, it was a great exercise and we learned a lot. And um, now we're pitching a philanthropic funder for season two. So, I mean, there are things, you know, where we see that things are succeeding, we wanna go deeper into that. So I would imagine that we're gonna probably integrate those animations into our teaching resources. So it'll, it, it's all about integrating our team better so that we're not working in silos. And um, yeah, and monetizing that through um, private funders, frankly. I had a question for you. Um, when you're that data focused, I'm wondering how that affects how you plan your editorial, your actual content. Do you have recurring editions? Do you go back maybe annually, look at your audience, see what you might tweak in your editorial plan? How does that work? So, I mean, the um, October, November issue, we generally try to do an issue that will resonate with Remembrance Day somehow. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, just in a very general way, you know, um, the 100th anniversary of the first women to get the boat, um, you know, I asked for a, a major women's package. So, you know, that was our cover feature and it was a big editorial package that we invested a lot into, especially for illustration. Um, but I'm only looking at content from a very, top level strategic point of view, like 
you could do military history, but could it be about women spies from Halifax? It could be about the ice thing. It could be about weird inventions. It could be, um, you know, about uh, the indigenous battalion. Like there's so many ways into the history that the data, I don't feel like the data is prescriptive. Um, yeah, we always do something for International Women's Day. We always put our package together for Indigenous History Month. And, mm -hmm. you know, we did a Tom Longboat, who was a, a, an elite marathon runner. Um, he was Mohawk. And um, we had that video in the can, but we waited to put it out um, so it would coincide with Indigenous History Month and Tom Longboat's birthday. So, you know, so we, you know, we, we try to parcel out the content according to when the audience might find it. So it's, um, I don't find the data prescriptive, except in the, just in the bigger general sense, like we need more um, diverse stories told by the people whose stories those are, you know, um, you know, this audience, we've got this young audience, are we delivering what teachers need to help those kids, you know, mm -hmm. at that age group. So in a more general way, I guess it's prescriptive, but when you get down to it, there's so many ways to move into a story.